Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to episode number 75 of the Know Your Physio podcast. I'm your host, Andres Prichel, helping you discover your science to optimize your life. And today's guest is Dr. Nathan Bryan. This is episode number 75, and I think it's a milestone for many reasons, but I think it's especially a milestone considering the breakthrough conversations that we had today that I think will revolutionize the health and wellness field as we know it. So before we begin today's show, I would love for you guys to become familiar with Dr. Bryan's background so you can really value the weight of the points that we cover on today's show. So Dr. Bryan earned his undergraduate Bachelor of Science degree in biochemistry from the University of Texas at Austin and his doctoral degree from Louisiana State University School of Medicine, where he was the recipient of the Dean's Award for Excellence in Research. He pursued his postdoctoral training as a Kirstein Fellow at Boston University School of Medicine in the Whitaker Cardiovascular Institute. And after two years postdoctoral fellowship in 2006, Dr. Bryan was recruited to join faculty at the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston by Farid Murad, MD, PhD, and 1998 Nobel Laureate in Medicine or Physiology. During his tenure as faculty and independent investigator at UT, his research focused on drug discovery through screening natural product libraries for active compounds. His nine years at UT led to several discoveries which have resulted in over a dozen issued U.S. and international patents and many more pending worldwide. Specifically, Dr. Bryan was the first to describe nitrite and nitrate as indispensable nutrients required for optimal cardiovascular health. He was the first to discover an endocrine function of nitric oxide via the formation of S-nitroglutathione and inorganic nitrite. Through the drug discovery program in natural product chemistry, Dr. Bryan discovered unique compositions of matter that can be used to safely and effectively generate and restore nitric oxide in humans. This technology is now validated in six published clinical trials. He's also a successful entrepreneur who has commercialized his nitric oxide technology through the formation of human to the power of N, Inc., formerly Neogenis Labs, where he is a founder and inventor. Dr. Bryan has been involved in nitric oxide research for the past 18 years and has made many seminal discoveries in the field. These discoveries and findings have transformed the development of safe and effective functional bioactive natural products in the treatment and prevention of human disease and may provide the basis for new preventative or therapeutic strategies in many chronic diseases. Dr. Bryan has published a number of highly cited papers and authored or edited five books. He is an international leader in molecular medicine and nitric oxide biochemistry. Listen, you guys, you're in for a treat with this episode. You're in for a treat. This is the, the real deal. And if you tune into the video version of this podcast, you'll just see that I'm, I'm just blown away by most of the things that, that he shares with us here on the show. So beyond that, I do want to give you a bit of a disclaimer. There is, we, we, towards the end of the show, we do flirt with the borders of controversy. And I'll just say early on that I will leave it to your interpretation. So make do in any way that you see fit with that information. But beyond that, um, all of the related research that we cover, articles, etc., as always, is linked in the show notes. So yeah, hope you guys enjoy the show. And I'll see you on the other side. All righty, so we are live. Dr. Brian, thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure to have you. Like I said, I've had the chance to dig into your science, dig into your work. I've learned a lot. And I've had the chance to experiment uh, in all sorts of environments, as I just mentioned. And uh, I am really impressed by how noticeable the effects of these products are and how substantial the performance gains were from you know everything from the cycling to high intensity interval training sessions to general weightlifting. Um, I apply some of the science even for this podcast. I mean, believe it or not, before every single podcast that I do, I have some dark chocolate. Um, <laughs> so maybe you can take the listeners as to why that works and how it works. Um, and even in the bedroom, like I said, and I know a lot of people will use apply this kind of science and these kinds of products for for that kind of thing. So uh, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you. Uh, like I said, big, big fan of your work, and, and it's such a pleasure to have you on here. Well, thanks for the invitation. It's great, great to be with you. And it's, you know, I always accept an invitation to educate and inform on the importance of nitric oxide. Sweet. So why don't we go ahead and begin with the, the why? So if you can tell us maybe why you started getting involved in this kind of work and, and how that led to, you know, years of study and, and becoming an expert in this field. 
Well, you know, I've always had an interest in science and medicine, and um, I got a degree in biochemistry from the University of Texas at Austin, and then from there, I uh, enrolled into LSU School of Medicine, where I was uh, working on a PhD in molecular cellular physiology, and this was, I believe this was the late 90s, early 2000s, and that was where I was first introduced to this whole science around nitric oxide. A Nobel Prize had just been awarded for its discovery, so the scientific community knew it was an extremely important molecule, but there were so many unanswered questions. Um, and so that was really how I got the introduction. I worked with a pharmacologist uh, named Martin Felish, who had been in the Inno field for probably the previous 10 or 15 years. Um, and that's when we started to investigate how the body produces nitric oxide. How can you detect and quantify nitric oxide in, in patients and humans? Uh, and then once we understand the biochemistry of how the nitric oxide is made, then that really set me on the path to developing safe and effective nitric oxide based drugs and product technology that you know we've had on the market now for a decade or more. And uh, and so it was this sort of a combination of, it was just the right time in terms of exposure. The science was very promising. You had a, a scientific background that was, that overlapped very nicely with this. And so it just felt like the right thing to do at the time. No, it was, I think anything we look back in on our lives and the kind of the evolution of careers, there's certain pivotal moments where you know, we stop and we pivot and, you know, take on a different direction. But yeah, so, you know, kind of the epiphany for me was, and I believe this was in the year 2000, we had Lou Ignaro come to LSU School of Medicine. He had just been awarded the Nobel Prize and he gave a lecture to the student body. And, you know, I was fortunate to go have dinner with him that night. And, you know, we just had a casual conversation about nitric oxide. And, you know, even to his surprise, you know, these discoveries were, you know, 15, 20 years old. Um, and a Nobel Prize had just been awarded, which he was one of the recipients. But he said, Nathan, he goes, I'm really shocked that a Nobel Prize was awarded because there's so much we don't know about nitric oxide, how the body produces it. We have a pretty good understanding, but, you know, the, in the underlying biochemistry and what goes wrong in people that can't make it, kind of what are the clinical consequences of that? And then, you know, we really don't know how to restore nitric oxide production in humans in terms of developing safe and effective therapeutics. So to me, wow. that was like my wow goes, well, this is really a, a rich uh, source and, and topic for not only discovery, but really having the opportunity to change the world and change people's lives. If you can figure out how to re recapitulate nitric oxide based signaling and production in the human body. And that, that's unbelievable. That was during a dinner with a Nobel Prize winner. That's right. <laughs> it's, it's, it's almost like I can't even begin to imagine the way you must have felt and the opportunity that you must have seen on the horizon having this kind of conversation, right? It's like a sort of like passing in the torch, but then you're like, hey, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so are you sure you, you, are you, you know, you sure you guys, you guys won, you know, what, what's, what's up ahead? You know what I mean? So that's, that's, that's unbelievable. Um, and maybe before we, we dive into nitric oxide and, and what it is, how it works, how important it is for all kinds of, you know, health, wellness, longevity, performance, um, can you maybe give a couple words of advice to young people that maybe need to have this kind of epiphany or this kind of conversation to take action when opportunity is there? Yeah, you know, what I've learned in, in really, I'm, I just turned 49 a couple of months ago, but, you know, in my 49 years of existence that... People are willing to help you, but if you don't ask for help, you're not going to get the help. You know, I think we all have mentors and kind of heroes in our respective fields that we feel intimidated by. And, you know, a lot of times these people feel un unapproachable, but, you know, most of these people are, you know, altruistic. They want to see the next generation succeed and kind of carry the torch. So you have to engage and you have to ask questions. And if you need help, you need to ask for help. Uh, don't sit back and think you can solve the problems by yourself. There are resources out there. And the other important thing was, you know, when I first started kind of challenging the, the, the current dogma at the time, you know, I had a lot of my academic colleagues and people who I'd looked up to, you know, question me and challenge me. And, you know, you have to have the confidence and the fortitude to stay the course. You know, I was convinced early on that what we were doing was extremely important. It went against the standard dogma. Uh, but, you know, it goes back to, I like a quote from Schopenheimer back in, I think the 14, 1500s. He says, all truths pass through three phases. First, it's ridiculed, then it's violently opposed, and then it's accepted as being self-evident. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And I've witnessed all those, you know, certainly my concepts and ideas in nitric oxide were ridiculed early on. They've been violently opposed, but, you know, fast forward 20 years, everybody accepts the fact that nitric oxide production is self-evident. Uh, and so I've witnessed these kind of three phases of truce over the past 25 years. Wow. Wow. Well, um, what an honor to to have you here today to uh, tell the story and to inspire us to ask these questions, ask for help, and to understand that when you're doing this kind of important work, there's these three separate phases. They're going to be difficult. You're going to feel challenged. And I'll tell you that I've certainly felt challenged from my mentors. And something that goes along nicely with what you just shared that my one of my mentors shared with me early on was he said, you know, uh, a lack of evidence doesn't mean evidence is lacking. You know, just because we don't yet have the science to explain something doesn't mean that there's no such thing as the science to explain that thing. You know, it's we're constantly developing the science, constantly running the studies, doing the research, staying skeptical, um, asking questions. And uh, it's conversations like these that will inspire and help the next the next generation. So, um, well, that's how science advances, right? We have to continue to to ask the questions and, you know, challenge the current dogma and you know, the, the greatest enemy of knowledge is not ignorance. It's the illusion of knowledge. And I think when people have an illusion of knowledge and the inability to accept kind of new perspectives or new angles on science, then that's what becomes extremely dangerous and impedes scientific development and innovation. Wow. And I think there's, if I'm not mistaken, there's a sort of graph when people are just starting to learn a new subject or a new skill and they get past that beginner phase they start to get almost arrogant and they think that they know more than they really do. And that's where it becomes dangerous because that's when people start forming their, their, their own theories and their own hypotheses and they start to uh, pretend as if they're experts. And then once you get to the expert level, the experts know that they in fact know nothing. You know, They maybe have very, very niche perspectives, very, very niche understandings, but their general perspective on their knowledge is at a very, much lower than, than what others would perceive. Yeah, no, that's right. You know, in academia and teaching, you know, graduate students and future physicians and medical students, you know, there's a different level of understanding and learning that you have to take on and accept in order to teach something, right? So you can regurgitate a lot and, and be called a, a so-called expert, but in order to teach something and be prepared to answer the most naive questions and, you know, come up with a, a good answer is a different level of understanding. And so that's what I've tried to do over the past 20 years is, you know, I continue to learn. I, I certainly don't profess to know everything there is to know about nitric oxide. You know, I still read the literature. There are things I learn every day. But those that stop learning because of the arrogance and the hubris that they think they already know everything, uh, those are the people that impede science. You know what I was describing was the, the Dunning-Kruger effect. So it's on yeah, the X... Yeah, on the x-axis, we have wisdom. On the y-axis, we have confidence. So in the beginning, you know, you have low wisdom, low confidence. You know nothing. Then you have the peak of Mount Stupid, which is where you have very high confidence and low wisdom. Then it falls. Then you have the valley of despair. So that's moderate wisdom and low confidence. And then you start to get this upward trend, a pretty linear trend. So the slope of enlightenment, and then eventually the plateau of sustainability where you have high confidence, high wisdom, but even experts, they are always skeptical. They always know that there's something new to learn. And, um, they are real experts are, they know when to say when they're wrong or when they don't know, and they're willing to, you know, receive these new ideas, theories, and integrate it into their yep. uh, level of understanding. No, I think um, sometimes the best answer is I don't know. Yeah. You know, if you don't know, I think we have to kind of swallow our pride and and admit that we don't always have the answers, but the worst thing you can do is make up an answer that's not based on scientific fact and evidence. So why don't we go ahead and jump right into nitric oxide, uh, what it is, how it works, and where we're currently at in the literature. Yep. And maybe you can well, take us through nitric oxide is a gas. Yeah, it's, it's a gas that's produced. It was first discovered by being produced in the lining of the blood vessels. And in normal human physiology, it's standard temperature and pressure it's a gas. And this was really kind of what transformed, I think, what led to the, the awarding of the Nobel Prize, because the signal transduction by a gas was a completely different signaling mechanism than what we'd been taught in you know, kind of this lock and key type signaling from like whether it's nuclear receptor or 
know, transmembrane signal transduction. Um, but it's once it's produced, it's gone in less than a second. So this fleeting gas now regulates a number of biological functions from the regulation of blood pressure and blood flow and circulation to the delivery of oxygen to individual cells by hemoglobin. Uh, it's a critical factor for our immune system. It's how our immune system kills off bacteria and viruses or any invading pathogen. And it's produced by our neurons. It's a neurotransmitter. Uh, so it, it signals um, you know, neurotransmission, uh, pain reception, nociception. It's a retrograde messenger in the central nervous system, controls gut motility, you know, obviously controls sexual function, you know, opens up the blood vessels of the sex organs so you can get engorgement and have uh, optimal sexual performance. So now that we understand what nitric oxide is and does, you can begin to appreciate what happens in people that can't make nitric oxide, right? We develop sexual dysfunction, our blood pressure goes up, we lose our memory, we lose signal transduction, we become insulin resistant. Uh, we develop mild cognitive disorders, even Alzheimer's. Uh, so a lot of bad things. In fact, most of the poorly managed chronic diseases around the globe today can be explained by a lack of nitric oxide production. And how do we actually produce this nitric oxide? Let's say, uh, for example, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with how the sun helps with general blood flow and how eating nitrate-rich vegetables, for example, can support this nitric oxide. But how does that actually, how does like sunlight and food and even supplements, how do those translate to nitric uh, oxide production? And how is that different from the supplemented uh, uh, versions or, or rather, yeah. sorry for the mix up. When you introduce sunlight, food and supplements, how is it different from our endogenous production if we're not exposed to these things? Well, to answer those questions, we first had to understand how the human body makes nitric oxide. Right, so there's two pathways the body uses to make nitric oxide. The first to be discovered, and again, the first to be discovered doesn't necessarily mean that it's the primary uh, pathway, was through an enzyme called nitric oxide synthase. And that enzyme is found in endothelial cells, the cells that line the blood vessels and lymphatics throughout the body. It's found in neurons, and it's found in our immune cells. So this enzyme will convert arginine, L arginine, which is a semi essential amino acid, into nitric oxide, and it gets citrulline as a byproduct. So these are semi-essential amino acids, meaning that the body makes these uh, endogenously through the urea cycle, but we also get it from our food, from the breakdown of proteins into these constituent amino acids. So there's no need to ever supplement arginine or citrulline. In fact, as we'll probably discuss, these amino acids can actually cause more harm than benefit because you, if you supplement them. Use, yeah, supplementing with arginine or citrulline. And that goes back to the late 90s. I mean, there's hundreds of products that are so-called nitric oxide products on the market that contain high doses of arginine and citrulline. And we, and we know that, you know, those do not generate nitric oxide. In fact, if you give those to patients with endothelial dysfunction or patients with peripheral artery disease or prior heart attack, that the patients actually get worse. And in fact, there were two clinical trials that were stopped because in post-infarct patients, these are patients who just suffered a heart attack. If they took L-arginine, there was an increase in mortality, increase in death than those that were taken up placebo. And, and why is that? Patients. Well, we now know that there's, if you have an uncoupled NOS enzyme and you push high dose arginine, that enzyme will actually generate superoxide instead of nitric oxide. So you're causing oxidative stress, you're exacerbating the underlying condition. Wow. And the other thing that happens is you get an upregulation of arginase. That's an enzyme that diverts arginine away from nitric oxide production and excretes it through ornithine and urea. So you're basically bypassing the whole nitric oxide production pathway and exacerbating oxidative stress wow. because the enzyme is uncoupled and it can no longer generate nitric oxide and, in, in fact, produces superoxide. And that's so unbelievable you how it's. Arginine you cannot give arginine to a patient with endothelial dysfunction. It's unbelievable how you may take it with a certain intention. It can do the opposite. And I, you know, of course with this, this is, this is true for all kinds of, of therapies and all kinds of medicine. And, and, you know, we can speak on behalf of the dose making the poison and such, but you know, a lot of people that take these supplements, for example, they're taking them for a boost in performance. And, right. you know, you, you find these things in supplements all the time. So are, are people wasting their money and are they doing more harm rather than good? 
Yeah, I think that's what the evidence shows. I mean, look, a lot of these products that are targeted or marketed toward nitric oxide have a laundry list of ingredients, right? You've got the amino acids, you get arginine, citrulline, you get resveratrol, you get vitamins, minerals, um, even food components. So I think, you know, a lot of these products are providing good quality ingredients, but they don't do anything in terms of nitric oxide production. And again, you have to be careful because if you exceed this threshold of what the body's not used to seeing, you know, 5, 10, 15 grams of L-arginine, then the body always compensates to what it gets. The body is not used to seeing that. So it detoxifies and diverts that uh, amino acid away from nitric oxide production through the excretion of urea, because the last thing you want to do is to get into nitrogen imbalance and develop hyperammonemia. Wow. And so what would work in order to actually, if someone is looking for the performance gains, let's say, what, what actually does work without producing harm? Yeah, so we talked about this enzyme nitric oxide synthase, but now we know that there's other ways the body makes nitric oxide. So from food, for example, we know the mechanism of a plant-based diet or vegetarian-based diet is due to the nitrate content of these foods that then the human body can, not necessarily will metabolize into nitric oxide, but can provided these systems are in place. So that requires you know, the right oral bacteria. It requires stomach acid production. And now the problem is globally, not just in the U.S., but globally, you know, two out of three people are using mouthwash every day, killing the oral microbiome, disrupting nitric oxide production. And then in the U.S. alone, there are over 200 million prescriptions written for antacids that shut down stomach acid production, uh, shut down nitric oxide production. Now there's clear evidence people who have been on PPIs, a certain class of antacids, for three to five years have about a 40% higher incidence of heart attack and stroke. Wow. Because you're disrupting nitric oxide production. That is unbelievable. And, and would you mind elaborating on the, the link between the oral uh, microbiome and, and nitric oxide production and, and maybe how folks can improve their oral health to support nitric oxide production? Well, about 15 years ago, we came across this. You know, there was enormous research efforts put on, you know, establishing the microbiome project. And most of these investigations and research was into the gut microbiome. We've certainly learned a lot. You know, there's fecal transplants now that are curing a lot of uh, systemic diseases, showing the importance of just transplantation of bacteria into the human body. But we started up top. We started in the oral cavity trying to understand the ecology of the oral microbiome, specifically as it relates to systemic nitric oxide production. So what we discovered was there are specific oral nitrate-reducing bacteria that live on the crypts of the tongue. And this was work we, you know, that was published, I think, in the early 90s. And so we followed up on that research to try to figure out, okay, can we capture, is there a correlation, an association between people who, people's blood pressure and their oral microbiome? And I think we published this in 2012, maybe 2008. But we, we saw a clear association between people who had an elevation in blood pressure and the lack of certain species of bacteria in the oral cavity. So that was a nice association, but it didn't tell us causation. Right. So we did a, a follow-up study where we took young, healthy uh, people with normal blood pressure, and then we simply eradicated the bacteria in their mouth by using chlorhexidine, astringent antiseptic mouthwash, twice a day for seven days. And what we witnessed was an increase in blood pressure, sometimes as much as a 20, 30 millimeter increase in blood pressure. I can't believe it. It was incredible. I mean, it was the most interesting observation we'd make that you could disrupt the oral microbiome and cause people to become hypertensive, clinically hypertensive, where they would be prescribed a prescription drug. That so now this is told us unbelievable. That, yeah, two out of three Americans use mouthwash and two out of three Americans have an unsafe elevation in blood pressure. This is no longer a coincidence. And now we're finding... If you've got uncontrolled or what's called resistant hypertension, right? So if you have high blood pressure, you go to your doctor, he puts you on a prescription medication. But yet 50% of the people that are medicated for high blood pressure don't normalize their blood pressure. Why is that? Well, it's because they're not targeting the oral microbiome. So now we're finding if you get people off mouthwash and give them a good diet and nitrate acts as a prebiotic to these bacteria, then blood pressure can normalize. 
So wow. this, this to me is the, probably the most profound discovery in cardiovascular medicine because hypertension is the number one risk factor for the number one killer of men and women worldwide, cardiovascular disease. And if we can now combat hypertension and combat cardiovascular disease, that'll change the face of healthcare. And it's simply by focusing on the oral microbiome and now for the first time getting people off prescription drugs. And that has never occurred in the history of medicine. If you go to your doctor, you're not managed. He's not trying to figure out how to get you off drugs. He's putting you on more drugs. And the more drugs people are on, the more it inhibits the body's natural ability to heal itself. So now we can actually start a conversation of how do we recapitulate physiology and get people off of prescription drugs? It's really not wow. making them better. In fact, they're making them worse. Wow, this completely changed the pace for, for you guys and for the future of medicine as a whole. I'll tell you that I had a chance to dig into some of your work, but I, I, I didn't expect such a profound influence on blood pressure just by targeting the oral microbiome. That's unbelievable. And so how are there any bad, what are some bad habits? We talk about, you know, yes, you can maintain a, a healthier diet, but if we get into the specifics, you know, what should, be, what should people be avoiding and what can they be adding in to support the gut microbiome? Like specific foods, supplements, habits. So I tell people, you only have to do two things. It's very simple. Stop doing the things that disrupt nitric oxide production and start doing the things that are clinically proven to promote it. Right. So then we have to, let's tackle those one by one. So sure. stop doing the things that disrupt nitric oxide production. Number one, it's mouthwash. If you're using mouthwash, you have to stop. I mean, any there's mouthwash. clear evidence now. Is it, any mouth, is it any mouthwash or alcohol-based mouthwash? Because I know that nowadays there's a lot of these natural mouthwashes that are like, you know, just like a salt, uh, a, a kind of like a, you know, you just swish around some salt water basically with like a, maybe like some, some, some mint, like it's like a natural kind of version. Is yeah. it? Is it specific to the alcohol or, or another ingredient in there? It's specific to any antiseptic mouthwash. So these natural mm. mouthwashes, right? you know, we really don't know. We haven't done the experiment, so I really can't say. But as long as it's not disrupting and killing non-selectively all bacteria, the good and the bad, there we go. then it's probably going to be fine. But alcohol-based mouthwashes um, disrupt the microbiome. Things like chlorhexidine, these stringent antiseptics, they all do the same thing. Uh, so not only does it make your blood pressure go up, uh, you know, we revealed, I think a couple of years ago, I was on the doctor's show here in the U.S. We revealed that if you use mouthwash, you lose the cardioprotective benefits of exercise. So think about this. We all try to do the right thing. We exercise, we try to eat right. But if you're doing, if you're using mouthwash, you're getting no benefit from diet. You're getting no benefit from exercise. So, I mean, that's, that's transformative. And I've witnessed this, you know, people get off mouthwash, uh, their blood pressure begins to normalize, uh, they feel better, uh, they're, they're able to perform better in the bedroom or on the athletic field or even in the gym, their, their performance improves. And, and that's very simple. That's cost saving, right? So I'm not, yeah. it's not costing you any more money. In fact, it's cost saving. Just stop using mouthwash. And, and what about thing uh... that people... Go ahead. I'm sorry. So, sorry to interrupt to interrupt you, but I'm, I'm wondering if, if toothpaste would have a similar effect, if any specific sorts of toothpaste would have an effect. Absolutely. So fluoride is an antiseptic. You know, there's fluoride in toothpaste. So I tell people, you know, you have to get rid of fluoride. Fluoride's a neurotoxin. I mean, it's one of the most toxic compounds on the periodic table. And most municipal water systems, at least here in the U.S., put fluoride in their water. Why? Because it's antiseptic. It prevents the bacteria from proliferating in the drinking water. But yet you're exposing yourself to fluoride, which kills your thyroid function. It's a neurotoxin and it's an antiseptic. It kills the bacteria in your mouth, which cause an increase in blood pressure. And it basically does the same thing as mouthwash. So you have to get rid of fluoride. Stop using fluoride-based toothpaste. There are fluoride-free toothpaste out there. If you live in an area where they put fluoride in your drinking water, and it's not just your drinking water, it's the water you bathe in, you heat it up to 104, 110 degrees, you volatilize this, you increase the, uh, wow. the absorption through the skin, through the lungs, and it's the water you cook in. So you have to get a home filtration system that removes fluoride and chlorine from your water supply. My, my mom is going to hate this because she's a, a dentist. 
a very passionate, very loving, loves what she does every single day. And she's told me my whole life. I, ever since I got into the health and wellness field, you know, I, I've heard about fluoride and about the, 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 the toothpaste and the mouthwash here and there, not to this, not with this level of depth or science. And she's like, no, but it's the, the cavities and the research. And I'm just like, I don't, I'm just not going to do it. And, and over the years, I've, I've, I've gotten more and more invested in the things that I have at home uh, as a means to filter this stuff out and any other heavy metals and toxins. So for example, we have, you know, a really good filtration system. It's a carbon filter and reverse osmosis. Then we add the minerals back in. Uh, we have a shower head filter. Uh, so we're, we're, we're never bathing in these fumes. And then uh, all the water that we cook with is, is, is filtered water. We have fluoride free toothpaste. We don't use mouthwash, but having this kind of science to, to back up these habits makes me feel as if I'm definitely not wearing a tinfoil hat. <laughs> you know, especially <laughs> around my mom. <laughs> well, you know, I think years ago, there was probably good reason based on the preponderance of evidence at the time. Yeah. But, you know, I, I speak at a lot of dental conferences and I ask a lot of these dentists why they do that. And they go, well, that's just the way we've always done it. Yeah. Well, that's very dangerous. If you don't take and apply new science, new discoveries, you know, years ago, we used to use leeches as a means of treatment, right? We don't do that anymore because the science tells us there are better ways and maybe it's not the best way. Yeah. So you have to apply new science, new discoveries in the clinical practice. And this excuse of, well, it's just the way we've always done it is, again, a very dangerous statement. Yeah. And this goes back to, you know, the earlier part of our conversation. And can on, this is this is what sets the ground for innovation and entrepreneurship. Right. And, um, you know. You're someone that is that has taken this opportunity to bring the science forward, and, and it's why we're having this conversation. And so, why why don't we have a little conversation about um, the actual, uh, uh, you know, the, the accessible means, or rather, if we can continue on the list of accessible ways to improve our, our oral microbiome. We spoke about the, the the mouthwash, the toothpaste, and you had something up next on your list, and I interrupted you. Uh, the next is antacids. So when, when we were talking about kind of what you have to do that or stop doing this disrupting nitric oxide. Pressure. So we talked about mouthwash. We talked about fluoride. The other are antacids. You know, our body needs stomach acid to make, to break down proteins into amino acids. If we, if we intentionally suppress stomach acid production, then a lot of bad things happen. Not only do you shut down nitric oxide production, but you can't break down proteins into amino acids. Then you get these peptide fragments that are absorbed across the gut and you develop foodborne allergies, autoimmune disease. All of this can be traced back to uh, the use of antacids. So we need stomach acid. If you're using antacids, you have to stop. You know, the, the U.S. FDA never approved these drugs for chronic use because of the known side effects and consequences of chronic inhibition of stomach acid. And now we're finding, you know, again, People have been on these for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, and the consequences of this are deadly. 40% higher incidence of heart attack and stroke, autoimmune disease. I mean, the laundry list goes on. All this can be traced back to lack of stomach acid. So then we have to give the body what it needs to create stomach acid. If you can't make stomach acid, you don't absorb B vitamins, you don't absorb zinc, you don't absorb iron, you don't absorb selenium, chromium, all these trace minerals that are dependent upon stomach acid. So now most people are deficient in these trace minerals and nutrients and the biochemistry of the human body can perform if it's in a state of nutrient deficiency. So now we have to give back and supplement what the body has been missing. And now this parietal cells can actually make hydrochloric acid and your body can actually perform as it's designed. So those are the three big things, mouthwash, fluoride, and antacids. If you're using them, you have to stop. And now to talk about what we can do to actually promote or activate nitric oxide production, you can do this once you stop all the things that disrupt it. And it's very simple. It's aerobic exercise. As little as 20, 30 minutes a day uh, can stimulate and activate nitric oxide production. Throwing in some more green leafy vegetables to provide more nitrate as a substrate for the body. And then you know, sunlight or um, infrared light therapy. I like full spectrum sunlight because, you know, there's certain uh, wavelengths or frequencies in the UV range that can release nitric oxide. There are certain frequencies in the kind of the full spectrum infrared, and those frequencies will actually knock nitric oxide off of metals that they're bound to. So this can liberate nitric oxide. 
And again, wow. 20 to 30 minutes of sunlight a day, or, you know, when I'm at home, especially during the winter, I sit in an infrared sauna once or twice a day. So you're getting that full spectrum infrared. Uh, it generates heat. So you actually sweat and detoxify. But those are the things that are really simple in terms of activating and, and promoting nitric oxide production. Yeah. And I know that some of the, the, the vegetables that are the highest, richest in nitric oxide, I think the number one is arugula, if I'm not mistaken. And then there's the, the beets. Yeah, there's, you know, there's a, a wide variability, but kind of broadly speaking, the darker the green leafy vegetable, typically the higher the nitrate content. So arugula, kale, spinach, things like that. But, you know, we published in 2015 that there are regional differences, and we only focused on the U.S., but we went to five regions across the U.S. and found as much as a 50 to 100-fold difference in the nitrate content of the same vegetable from Dallas to Chicago to Los Angeles to New York to, to Charlotte. So well, just because you're eating these vegetables doesn't necessarily mean that you're getting sufficient nitrate to produce nitric oxide in the human body. And uh, did you notice any difference between organic and non-organic produce? Yeah, interestingly, we compared the two. Conventionally grown vegetables have on average about five to ten times more nitrate than organically grown vegetables. <laughs> All so right. that, I mean, that's, that yeah. was really, you know, it really wasn't that surprising because when you, when you look at the yeah. field of agronomy and how plants assimilate nutrients and conventional growers use nitrogen based fertilizers, right? A standardized amount. And that's what I, I live on 800 acres in, out in Texas. We grow our own food. We wow. raise our own beef. Um, we grow our own vegetables. Acres. That's amazing. And, and so I sample the soil every two to three years to figure out what does this particular soil need to optimize growth. And if you don't replete the missing nitrogen, then these plants don't assimilate nitrogen in the form of nitrate. They don't assimilate other nutrients. So organic, you know, that's a huge category in terms of food. Yeah. And I think it's good, but most people don't know what organic means, right? Obviously it's free of herbicides and pesticides. But there's also restrictions on adding nitrogen-based fertilizers to the soil. So organic is good because you're not getting exposed to herbicides or pesticides, but you cannot eat enough organic vegetables to get enough nitrate to manage your blood pressure, for example. Wow. So it's a balance here. And what I do is kind of optimize that, add nitrogen to the soil, but certainly I don't add any herbicides or pesticides to the foods we're eating. And I don't use any GMO, genetically modified uh, seeds because I'm not adding the glyphosate and the herbicides to these. I don't need that. And how can I get my hands on uh, these uh, awesome stuff you're producing on these 800 acres? <laughs> you got to come visit. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would love to at some point, but that's, that's really interesting. As you can tell, I, I, I sort of saw this coming when I asked you the question. I had my fingers crossed, but it's just, it's just one of those things. Huh? So yeah. uh, what are some symptoms that we have low nitric oxide levels? And how can we take these symptoms and maybe see and pinpoint what it is that we need to change, whether it's what we're introducing to our oral microbiome or if it's in our food or if it's sunlight, like based on the symptoms, what are they and how can we make decisions about what we need to add in? Yep. Now, it's probably one of the most important questions because, you know, a lot of physicians, especially allopathic, allopathic physicians, consider the only things that we can measure are important. Right. That's why you go and you do blood draws. Right? So they measure your cholesterol, your vitamin D, your testosterone, your your iron levels. And then if those are, so nitric oxide is a gas. So it's not one of these things we can measure. You can't go to your doctor and go, can you measure my nitric oxide levels? There's ways we can do it kind of indirectly through some some functional diagnostic test. So what we have to rely on are the symptoms. So if you have an elevation in blood pressure, you're nitric oxide deficient. If you have insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, you become, you're nitric oxide deficient. If you have sexual dysfunction, either men or women, and you can't dilate the blood vessels of the sex organs to increase blood flow and engorgement, that's because your body can't make nitric oxide. If you get shortness of breath by walking up a flight of stairs or, you know, and you can't run or you become exercise intolerant, then your body cannot and is, is not producing nitric oxide. If you're developing, you know, loss of memory, mild cognitive disorders, what's called vascular dementia, that's because you're not getting enough blood to the brain because your blood vessels aren't making nitric oxide to increase perfusion to certain regions of the brain. So all of those, and in fact, most 
poorly managed chronic diseases around the globe can be explained by a lack of nitric oxide production. Right. And it's not necessarily that that's the reason as to why the disease is there, but they are so closely related that you might as well address the nitric oxide issue to improve the general uh, environment for the disease to subsid, subside. Sure. No, I think that's a very good point. And the one thing I want to qualify is that nitric oxide is not a panacea. It's not an end-all, be-all, cure-all. But what we've learned over the past 20 years in, in science is that all chronic disease whether it's Alzheimer's, heart disease, kidney disease, autoimmune disease, doesn't matter. There's four characteristics of all chronic disease. There's low blood flow to the affected organ. There's inflammation, oxidative stress, and immune dysfunction. Nitric oxide controls and regulates all four of those. So if you've got a problem, whether it's exposure to chronic uh, heavy metals, or if it's you know a, a latent viral infection, or exposure to some chemical toxicant, whatever organ that's affecting, that's going to be characteristics of that organ. So nitric oxide is not going to chelate or get rid of metals or rid the body of chemical toxicants. It can because if you're improving circulation, you're getting the good stuff in and taking the bad stuff out. But if you don't remove yourself from the source of exposure, then you're not going to get any better. Right. But clearly the role nitric oxide plays in improving blood flow, reducing inflammation, oxidative stress, and immune dysfunction, that will ameliorate the symptoms in that particular patient and should be considered a frontline therapy for that. But, you know, until you remove yourself from the source of exposure of your illness, nitric oxide will help, but it's not going to cure the particular patient. So you have to dig a little deeper. And I think that's the field of functional integrative medicine is trying to find the root cause of why people are sick. And for mm -hmm. me, my observations have led to the realization that people get sick for two reasons and two reasons only. And it doesn't matter what it is, if it's cancer, cardiovascular disease, liver disease, kidney disease, cognitive disorders, you're either the body's missing something that it needs, you become nutrient deficient, or the body's exposed to something that it doesn't need. So then we have to address those. So through good nutrition, micronutrient analysis, you can figure out what the body's missing and then figure out what the body's exposed to is it fluoride? Is it chlorine? Do we have a latent viral infection? Are we exposed to heavy metals? Do we have mold and mycotoxins in our body? So then you start to remediate that, get to the root cause, and then the body heals itself. The human yeah. body is designed to regenerate, to heal itself. We have to get out of the way, right? Give the body what it needs. The body heals itself. Yeah. And uh, I, I know that we've um, mentioned this several times now, but for maybe for the folks who aren't quite familiar in terms of mechanisms, um, when you increase nitric oxide, that helps to bring oxygen. So by vasodilating the, uh, the, the blood vessels with nitric oxide, you essentially support blood flow and therefore deliver more oxygen to the tissues that need it, especially in this case with, with chronic disease, you, you need to bring fresh blood and nutrients to help repair the uh, the, the area, the, the, the muscle, the organ, et cetera. No, you're exactly right, but it's two separate mechanisms. Okay. So in terms of delivering oxygen, so we have to nitric oxide, what's called a vasodilator. So it dilates the blood vessels. So now you're getting more blood flow downstream. But in terms of oxygen delivery, nitric oxide is required to be bound to hemoglobin for oxygen to come off. And it's, it's part of the cardiorespiratory cycle. So this is the work of Jonathan Stamler, who discovered that the cardiorespiratory cycle is now a three gas system. So when we breathe in, we're taking up oxygen. We circulate that throughout the body. Oxygen comes off. We pick up carbon dioxide and we excrete it in the exhaled breath. But if you don't have nitric oxide on board, oxygen does not come off of hemoglobin. So there's a, a signal transduction pathway where nitric oxide allows the release, allows this transition from the arterial to venous transit that allows for the offloading of oxygen and the uh, pickup of CO2 and excretion. And this became very apparent in the past three years with COVID. Because what's the problem with COVID, right? We lose blood oxygen saturation. We develop hypoxemia. You put patients on 100% oxygen, and then you mechanically ventilate them, and then people die. So why is it that if you give 100% oxygen, you don't improve oxygen saturation in these patients? It's because you're not correcting the nitric oxide signaling aspects 
of oxygen uptake and oxygen delivery. And you may or may not know, but we just had a COVID, a nitric oxide drug in phase three clinical trials in high risk COVID patients. And we saw that if we gave them the drug, we could improve blood oxygen saturation from in one patient, 76 to 98 in eight minutes. And that's oh just breathing goodness. room air. We didn't even have to put them on supplemental oxygen. Jeez. So the fundamental aspects of COVID or any respiratory disease and the people who get sick and die from COVID are the same people who get sick and die from flu or any respiratory virus. Those are the patients who can't make nitric oxide. If we restore nitric oxide production in these high risk patients, we prevent the progression of disease. It's unbelievable because, you know, I graduated just a few years back um, and we had several classes on advanced, you know, pulmonary physiology, high altitude physiology, all, all sorts of stuff. And we do learn about nitric oxide, but not about this critical role that it plays. And I'm just like shocked because I wonder when are they going to update these textbooks and resources to reflect this new research that changes, absolutely changes the game for just about everybody, you know? Yep. Well, we know if, if you look historically, it takes on average 17 years for new discoveries to become standard of care or kind of mainstream. You know, we're well past that now. You know, the Nobel Prize was awarded 20, what, 24 years ago. So we're way past that 17 year mark of adoption into standard of care and mainstream medicine. So, you know, I think we're making progress. And I think, you know, that's why what you do is so important and allow, you know, a platform for, for education and the dissemination of information. You know, I tried to teach this when I was um, on faculty at the University of Texas Medical School and try to get this into the curriculum. You know, I taught a class called the Molecular Basis for Cell Signaling. These were typically MD, PhD students. Um, but this isn't taught to the normal medical school class. Uh, you know, and I think it should. There's enough evidence out there in, in scientific published literature that this nitric oxide should be incorporated into all aspects of physiology. Beyond your help and, 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 and your influence, is there a real effort to implement this kind of education in the, you know, uh, either the physiology or its general medical field, you know, across the board for, for incoming doctors? No, in, th in fact, I think it's just the opposite. There may be an intentional effort to suppress this. Because you think about this, this is transformative in terms of medicine. The practice of medicine is really funded by big pharma, right? And so what we do in terms of delivering safe and effective nitric oxide based product technology or therapies is disruptive to the pharma model, right? So the number one rule of business is never lose a customer. So if you're a big pharmaceutical company, the last thing you want to see is one of your patients get off a prescription drug, right? Now you're affecting the economics of the practice of medicine. And what we've witnessed over the past 10, 15, 20 years is if you can get people's nitric oxide production optimized and stimulate nitric oxide production, there's really a not, a, not a lot of need for pharmacotherapy. So I think what we're doing is so disruptive that there may be a concerted effort to suppress this. We witnessed this during our drug development for COVID uh, because nobody wanted a safe and effective early therapeutic at a time when they were trying to uh, mandate vaccines. Uh, there was no effort uh, to get safe and effective early stage treatments for COVID-19. All the effort was on vaccines. And now fast forward three years later, we know that they're not effective in transmission of disease. They don't prevent death. They don't uh, prevent transmission or infection. And in fact, they're not even safe. They did more harm than good. And I know that we're, we're certainly flirting with the borders of controversy here, but um, I mean, I'm, 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 t I'm totally with you. <laughs> uh, I'm sure there's a lot of people tuning in who may be resistant to this kind of information, this kind of um, awareness and insight. But even even then, it's it's shocking to hear this. I mean, uh, it's absolutely shocking. Um, what a shame, you know. Yeah, but you know, we, we you know, I I use this as a badge of honor because certainly I've been the target of, of lawsuits and you know ridicule. Uh, but that's when I know that we're doing something that's very important. If what we were doing was trivial and didn't mean anything, people would leave you alone, right? right. Because it's meaningless. When you're doing something that's critically important, that's so-called life-changing and transformative to a multi-trillion dollar a year industry, then you become a target. So I've created a research 
foundation and a research institute where we provide uh, continuing medical education specific toward nitric oxide. So now we've got a number of uh, congresses and, and kind of medical education uh, scientific forums that are adopting our nitric oxide education platform so that now I don't think it's going to be taught in medical schools anytime in the near future. I think hopefully eventually it will. But what we try to do now is we target physicians going for continuing medical education to now learn more about the science of nitric oxide in a accredited continuing medical education, non-commercial format so that they, number one, learn about the biochemistry of nitric oxide how to recognize nitric oxide deficiency in their patients, and then make these simple recommendations, uh, eliminate your mouthwash, get rid of fluoride, stop using antacids, diet and exercise, and their patients get better. Wow. Um, I'm, I, 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 I really admire the way that you wear this as a badge of honor. I would too. And it's unbelievable how we mentioned these three stages of truth. And now we're in the second stage, right? People will ridicule, right. people will ridicule you. They'll, they'll target you. They'll challenge you. And I think it's just a matter of time before this becomes common knowledge and is respected. And I know that this conversation years from now will have had an impact and, and more conversations around this topic will have an impact. And so uh, I'm with you there, wearing this as, as, as a badge of honor. We have to bring this uh, uh, information to light. And uh, if it's all right with you, I'd like to maybe change the pace a little bit. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how we can have some fun with uh, nitric oxide, if you know what I mean. So there was, uh, it's, you know, Valentine's Day is around the corner. So I think this is perfectly timed. <laughs> and something that I wrote up, an article that I wrote up last year, um, the day before Valentine's Day was about boosting nitric oxide for uh, not just bedroom performance, but actual dating performance. Sure. Because when you open up the blood vessels and therefore lower your blood pressure, you're more relaxed. You can have a more relaxed, natural flow of conversation, of trust and confidence. And so I spoke about, you know, adding in, having a dinner with um, some aphrodisiac style foods and then adding in some beets and arugula in there strategically, having some you know, a glass of, of red wine, uh, staying hydrated, um, getting some chocolate. So you get the nitrates, yeah. but you also get, you know, the boost in oxytocin. So there's more of this trust and, and honesty. And, and so I, I'd love to get your take and, 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 and I'd love to get uh, maybe some further suggestions from you for the, for those tuning in and want to have some fun on, on Valentine's day. Well, I think, you know, like February is not only Valentine's day, but it's uh, heart health month. And, you know, where we try to focus on, you know, combating the number one killer of men and women worldwide, which is cardiovascular disease. And really the first sign and symptom of vascular dysfunction or cardiovascular disease is erectile dysfunction. You know, we spend a lot of time on, you know, courtship and building this trust and relationship that um, sometimes culminates in, in sexual intercourse. And so if you spend all this time and effort, but yet you don't have sufficient blood flow to actually enjoy and have an optimal sexual performance, then, you know, all this is for naught. Right. Uh, so as you mentioned it, there's, there's certain things you can do. I think the epicatechins in, in dark chocolate can stimulate nitric oxide production. There is veritrol and, and there's some nitrate in the red wines uh, that will allow for good vascular function. The, the, the diet, the vegetables, you know, as we mentioned earlier, there's not always a guarantee that you're going to get sufficient nitrate from your vegetables. Or so not not organic in this case. It's the way yeah, you're not going to get the benefit of it. <laughs> right. So what we've done, and you know, this is kind of what we've been focused on for the past 20 years is now that we understood how the human body makes nitric oxide through both pathways, we understand what goes wrong and people that can't make it. And we understand the clinical symptoms. The next question was with kind of our next kind of chapter is how do we restore nitric oxide production in the human body? And when I, when, when we, started asking this question in the, in the research lab, the whole concept was if your body can't make nitric oxide, then we have to do it for you, right? It's kind of like testosterone therapy, that if your body, if you're low in testosterone, your body's obviously not making it for whatever reason. So we have to give the body what it needs. So that was the first premise. Number two is we had to do something that's not been done before. And that's restore the production, get to the root cause of why the body can't make nitric oxide. 
recouple the nitric oxide synthase enzyme so that the body's own ability to make nitric oxide is improved. And that's what we've done with our product technology. So anything we bring to market, you, you can guarantee that we can quantify, we can verify the amount of nitric oxide that's being liberated from these products. The first product we brought to market was a lozenge. It's an orally disintegrating tablet. And I designed that to have a resident time of about five to six minutes. So you put this lozenge in your mouth and over that five to six minutes, we're generating nitric oxide gas in the oral cavity. In fact, about 20 to 30, sometimes 40 parts per million NO gas. We can detect it, we can quantify it, we can verify it. It's vasoactive, meaning that we can see dilation of the carotid arteries within about 12 to 15 seconds from that lozenge being put in wow. your mouth. It lowers blood pressure if you have high blood pressure. It improves exercise performance. It improves sexual performance. It really does everything that nitric oxide has been known to do. So that technology really overcomes the body's deficits or deficiencies in its ability to produce nitric oxide. Wow. And then you mentioned beets. You know, beets have been a hero vegetable for probably the past 10 years. So we early on, we developed a beet product. Now, most recently... You know, because beets are the third least liked vegetable on the planet. <laughs> There's a lot of people who don't like the taste. And of now, now the carnivores incoming and, and, you know, you've got the, the anti-nutrients or and the oxalates or whatever. I, I can't, I can't stand it. Um, so, well, you know, what we've done in, in last year, we launched a product where we've taken beets, we ferment them. So we optimize the nutrient density. We remove the beet pulp, the beet color, the beet taste and the oxalates. Wow. And we add electrolytes because most people are cellular dehydrated. So we add electrolytes and we add mitochondrial ATP. So now you've got a, a beet powder that you reconstitute in water, two to three ounces of water. You take it as a shot. So as soon as you put that powder in water, it generates nitric oxide gas. Then when you consume it, that product generates nitric oxide in the human body. And that product is called NO Beets. It's a fantastic product as a pre-workout, uh, as an energy drink. You know, part of our placement in that was to replace things like five hour energy, Red Bull, these monster energy drinks that are not right. only dangerous and unsafe, but they're causing, you know, it's not a natural energy source. And that's a multi billion dollar a year industry. Why not take a natural energy source, improve circulation, improve hydration, improve energy production at the level of the mitochondria? Now you get natural energy and it's actually health promoting. There's no stimulants, there's no vasoconstrictors, there's no caffeine where you don't get the crash. So right. I think this product I'm extremely proud of. It's a home run ball. Uh, and I think it will transform not just the pre-workout kind of segment, but the energy drinks and the energy segments, because now we're providing a safe and effective product and it's energy promoting. Yeah. And uh, something I want to maybe uh, color in for the for those tuning in is... Um, just how this feels, how it feels. I mean, I haven't taken this specific product, but I have taken uh, the other beetroot uh, products. And um, it's a different, it's a very different kind of energy versus something like caffeine. You don't feel wired. You, I personally feel like my threshold is a lot higher and I can meet and stay at that threshold for a lot longer without feeling the anxiety, without feeling like, yeah, like, like I'm, I'm super, super wired. So can you speak on behalf of the science and, and, and how this yes. compares to something like caffeine? Well, when you look at performance, you know, there's different kind of metrics of performance. So one of them is kind of the anaerobic threshold of how well you can push oxygen into tissue and prevent the anaerobic uh, metabolism and lactic acid buildup. So nitric oxide dilates the blood vessels, extends the oxygen gradient in the tissue, so you can go longer, stronger, faster, right? Just because you have better oxygen delivery and you improve the efficiency of mitochondrial ATP production with less oxygen. So that's number one. But we also have kind of subjective evidence that the perceived exertion is improved. And, you know, so for me, and as I mentioned, I'm 49 and I'm in you know, really good health. I'm, I'm obviously health conscious. So when, when I take it, unless I'm, stress or absolutely fatigued, I don't necessarily feel it unless I go to the gym. Yeah. So when I go to the gym, I do 20, 30 minutes of cardio. I do 20, 30 minutes of, you know, high intensity interval training or resistance training. And then I go sit in a sauna for 30 minutes. 
So I would start out in that routine. Typically, I kind of know what, what my weight limit is and what my level of exertion is. Now, if I take our nitric oxide lozenge or our fermented beet powder before, now that same regimen seems much simpler. Yeah, you know, a I lot feel easier. like I can push more weight. <laughs> yeah. I don't fatigue during the high, inter, uh, high intensity interval training, and I feel like I just have more energy and I perform better. Yeah. You know, so we have objective endpoints and measurements on that, but also subjective because the most important experiment is the n equal one. How does it affect you? How does yeah. it make you feel? Yeah, and I, uh, for the for the gym bros in here, this is if you compare this to caffeine, you're when you see that that cute girl in the squat rack, you're not going to be anxious. You're going to be honestly uh, more open and 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 yeah, less right. less less stressed about approaching her and and uh, and helping her out there. So. The, the truth is that it absolutely has this effect on a subjective level, at least for me and for the people that I've introduced some of these products to. And um, it's really cool to have energy without anxiety, without jitters, without a crash, and to support, like you said, your total body wellness in the process as well. So it's not going to take away from your sleep. It's not going to contribute to any disease. It's not going to make you overactive. It's not going to lead you to over, you know, exert. So um, yeah, that's, that's, thank you for taking us through that. Um, I, I'm, I'm curious, is there anything else on the, on the horizon for you, any incoming research or projects that you're excited about that you want to share with the audience? Well, now I'm at this phase in my career where, you know, I'm pretty much retired from full-time academia and the basic sciences, because for me, we had answered the, the relevant questions. So for me, the next phase was how do we integrate this into clinical practice? How do we introduce safe and effective product technology to now get this in the hands of the people that we can affect, the global population? Right. So once we figured out how to make nitric oxide, now the, the next step was, and kind of my objective, kind of laser focus now is, how do we bring safe and effective product technology into every major market segment around the world? So we've done this in nutrition, in dietary supplements, a couple of years ago, I created a skincare company where we, we have a topical nitric oxide for, for skincare and beauty. You know, we, people forget that the skin is an organ, in fact, one of the largest. And without sufficient blood flow, that organ fails. So we get fine lines and wrinkles, we get acne, we get dermatitis. So I developed a topical nitric oxide that's really, it's a new category in skincare and beauty. Wow. Uh, and in fact, it's so effective that we, I've started a drug company. So not only are we developing safe and effective oral dose forms of nitric oxide, but we're developing topical nitric oxide drugs for diabetic ulcers, decubitus wow. pressure ulcers, non-healing wounds. So, and we found nitric oxide is what's critical for, for wound healing. So most chronic wounds are infected. Nitric oxide is antibacterial, so it kills the infection and it causes hyperemia and gets blood flow to that wound or to that ulcer. And so to heal a wound, you got to kill the infection, you got to get blood flow, and you got to remove the, the pressure if it's a pressure sore. Nitric oxide does two out of the three. Kills the infection, causes hyperemia, tissue granulation, stem cell mobilization, and the healing process. So we wow. have data now where we've taken three to four-year-old non-healing ulcers. We apply our topical nitric oxide, and within three to four months, we completely heal these non-healing wounds. To me, wow. that will ch there's been no innovations in wound care for 50 years. We treat wounds today the same way we did 50 years ago. Negative pressure uh, and then, you know, some granulation uh, type therapeutics, um, collagenase to kind of break down the wound to allow for the rehealing. But nitric oxide is a game changer in that. Uh, we just finished our COVID drug study. Uh, there was no adverse events in the highest risk population uh, that's out there. So now the FDA is allowing us to go straight into phase three clinical trials for all our other drug indications. So now we've got drug programs for ischemic heart disease. Uh, 33 million Americans are living with ischemic heart disease, poorly managed. Ischemic non-obstructive coronary disease, it's a small vessel disease. We're seeing enormous clinical benefit. Uh, we've got a drug program around Alzheimer's. You know, Alzheimer's is probably one of the most feared diseases that people uh, fear getting around the globe because of the burden it puts on family members. And, you know, all Alzheimer's drugs have failed. So we asked ourselves, why is that? It's because the drug companies are going after the consequence of disease, the beta amyloid plaque, the tau tangles. That doesn't cause the disease. 
The cause of disease is a lack of blood flow. So if you don't get the good stuff in and take the metabolic waste out, you get a buildup of amyloid plaque, you get a buildup of tau tangles. So what we're finding is if we give early stage dementia, vascular dementia, pre-Alzheimer's patients, nitric oxide, not only are we improving cerebral perfusion and getting blood flow to these regions of the brain, their cognition improves. So now you get to the root cause of Alzheimer's and neurological disease. It's lack of blood flow. You know, so there's... It, uh, go, ischemic go for it. Ischemic heart it. disease, ischemic non-obstructive, Alzheimer's disease, topical drugs for diabetic ulcers, and will move eventually into pulmonary hypertension, congestive heart failure. All of these indications are very well affected by nitric oxide. And my apologies for the interruption, but I wanted to make sure to mention that on behalf of the Alzheimer's research, I think um, Max Lugavir, he he shared an incredible analogy. I don't know if it was his directly, so I, I can't give him full credit if that's the case, but he mentioned this on a Joe Rogan podcast recently. He said that the current approach, the current model for Alzheimer's care is the scientists or the pharmaceutical companies are going in and they're removing the, the, the gravestones from the graves. So the damage has already been done and they're removing the evidence of that damage, so to speak, but they're not actually addressing the death itself or the, or the, 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 the onset of That's the right. disease or, or targeting at, at, at the root cause. So um, the research that we currently have on Alzheimer's that supports a lot of these uh, therapies that aren't warranted is based around, you know, the, the, you can relate them to this analogy. It's not an effective means of care. Um, well, that, that's, that's, that's really fascinating. And do you think that, um, you know, I showed you the little chocolate bar that I had before each and every podcast. Do you think that this would improve uh, cognitive performance as well? We've spoken about physical performance, about the bedroom, about preventing disease. But if I take this in addition to my chocolate, do you think I'll have even better flow, concentration, better conversations with my guests? Now, absolutely. We have objective data on this, looking at functional MRIs and uh, perfusion to certain regions of the brain. You know, working with Daniel Amen in these spec scans, you know, Dr. Amen's thought is that every major chronic neurological disease is caused by a lack of blood flow. And certainly nitric oxide does that. We've, we've had before and afters of both functional MRI, spec scans, and improved cognition in patients with uh, so-called mild cognitive disorders and vascular dementia. So again, I don't see, what we do is generate nitric oxide at the right dose at the right time in the right patient. And in that scenario, there's not a single indication where nitric oxide would not be beneficial. And I think, you know, looking forward, I think I've been quoted as saying that this this is the penicillin of the 21st century, right? These discoveries around nitric oxide and the implementation of nitric oxide-based therapy will change the world in terms of, in the face of healthcare. It will be how we treat people for the next hundred years. Just like penicillin changed the landscape of, of infectious disease, nitric oxide will change the face of the management of all chronic diseases. Wow. Um, and, you know, you mentioned the the brain scans with Dr. Amen, who I would love to have on the show at some point. Um, I'm, I'm curious if you've seen I'm curious what your take is on on caffeine, considering that it reduces blood flow to the brain. You know, are you in that case from the nitric oxide perspective? Are you for or against caffeine for mental performance and and such? Well, I think it's you know it's dose dependent, right? Caffeine's a naturally occurring compound, uh, but it, again, it's a vasoconstrictor, and most of these pre workouts that are targeted towards nitric oxide that really don't do anything to nitric oxide. All of them have caffeine. You know, most of these companies have approached me and go, how can we make an effective nitric oxide product? And I said, well, the first thing you got to do is take the caffeine out. They go, well, we've tried that. Then the product doesn't work. And I go, okay, well, you don't have a nitric oxide product. You got a caffeinated product. (laughs) Take out the active ingredient caffeine. Then obviously the product doesn't work. But no, I'm not a big big fan of caffeine. I think, you know, if you look at the published literature, caffeine is effective at perceived exertion in terms yeah. of pre-workout, Computer but physiologically and biochemically, you know, it's counterproductive because it's leading to vasoconstriction, reduced blood flow, reduced oxygen uh, delivery, and, you know, compromised metabolic function. Wow. Oh, man. Well, I have so many more questions, but I I know uh, we're, we're a bit short on time here. I... Um, 
would love to go ahead and share this with my audience in time. And, and I want to respect your time and, and all your incredible work. And I just want to say, you know, first and foremost, thank you for taking us to the research for all the work that you're doing and uh, for being so willing to share and to bring this message forward. I mean, I know that you have uh, retired in academia, but in, in, in my opinion, this is the most important academia. You know, this, com- this kind of conversation for, for, the, for the masses, making it accessible. I think that's where the real change is. And so thank you for wearing this as a medal of honor for joining me today and for being so willing and, and so professional and, 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 and sharing these opinions and, 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 and expertise. <laughs> yeah, my pleasure. You know, I will say I've got, you know, I've written, published several books and, you know, hundreds of scientific papers, which I found that the public typically doesn't read scientific papers. So now we have to kind of translate these scientific discoveries into something that's easily digestible and translatable to the so-called layperson. So I've got a book that's going to come out probably second or third quarter of this year called The Secret of Nitric Oxide. Um, I'm in the process of, of writing that now. I've got a mid-March deadline. But really the objective is to, you know, it's, it's, two, it's twofold. Number one is to kind of tell my personal journey and story around the discovery of nitric oxide, kind of what directed me in this path. And then the second part of the book is really talks about the science of nitric oxide and how you can take what we've learned over the past 20 or 30 years and apply that into your own life. So people can adopt these very simple principles that we discussed today and then see the transformation of their own health. So look for that. It's called the secret of nitric oxide. It's by a major publisher uh, here in the U S but that'll be uh, probably uh, summer, uh, early fall. Absolutely. And maybe uh, uh, when the book comes out, uh, I'll, I'll make sure to write a, a relevant article. I'd love to read it, get my hands on it, write a relevant article, uh, help help spread the message and spread the word, and maybe even have you back on the show to to help with, with the launch in some way. I would absolutely love to be involved. Absolutely. That'd be, that'd be great. Awesome. Well, hey, Dr. Brian, thank you so, so much for your time and for all your incredible work. It's really been a pleasure. Well, thank you, Andres. I look forward to uh, connecting in the future.